Hello guys, welcome to the Journey Podcast. Today I have um, someone here to help us in our first episode of the book review to help us re- review a book. So she will introduce herself and then we'll get talking about the book. So go ahead, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Rudia Isak and I'm a librarian in North Carolina and I'm of Ethiopian heritage. Oh wow. Um I almost want to ask you to, to speak something to say something in Ethiopian, but I probably wouldn't do that. I wouldn't put you on that spot. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh so yeah, um really um uh, we would be reviewing a book and I think that um uh, what um just give me how your relationship with books in general relationship with books in general so i am an avid reader as a librarian of course you have to deal with books like day in and day out but it's something that i've always been passionate about since i learned how to read when i was about like five um so learning through books is also one thing that i enjoy doing um i have started to look into more nonfiction books. Um, my um, first introduction to nonfiction books was through my dad, who uh, is a theologian. And so he would pass along some books that he would think that our mind able to grow our minds. Mm-hmm. And uh, some of those swings that have uh, been recommended include the book that we're going to discuss today. Okay, yeah, that's good. I think that uh, how do you how do you categorize this book we're about to, we're about to review? I would categorize it as um, just a, a thoughtful discussion on what intellectualism is to Christians. So it's it's more like something to that's thought provoking than something that not so much you are given a whole bunch of information that nonfiction books tend to give you without um, really grasping like, hey, this is something that you may have already known, but I'm just going to give you some insight on why you know that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, so quickly, can you just introduce our book? Um, and, oh, and before we go into the introduction is that we would be we will be ha- having be doing this for two episodes. We will review, although it's a short, short read, but we will do it for two episodes just to ensure that we uh, really, as much as we can, have of this book. And I hope that that is really beneficial for uh, everyone listening. So, um, could you go, just go ahead and introduce our book and then so we can dive right in? Yeah, sure. So our book is called Your Mind Matters by John Stott. And before we start talking about the book, I wanted to just introduce people from the audience about who John Stott is. John Stott was an Anglican minister who emphasized the need to uh, for intellectualism and in Christianity. Mm-hmm. Um, he was known for his evangelical ministry. And he was an author of several books, um, one of them being Basic Christianity, which is one of his most popular works. Yeah. Um, he's a very, he was a very respected biblical scholar and teacher, too. So what we are first going to be introducing about the book is it was actually taken from a speech that he did in 1972 mm, um, to, during an InterVarsity Christian Fellowship Conference. So the purpose of the speech was to explain how critical thinking should go hand in hand in uh, ritualism, activism, and your experience, your Christian experience. So uh, one thing that he goes into detail in and is mainly the the meat of the book is these six traits of a Christian walk. So the first couple of them are worship, faith, and holiness. And that's where we're going to break up our first and second episode. The next episode, we'll be talking about guidance, evangelism, and ministry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that brief introduction. I think um, also is that the reason why we're actually starting with a John Stott book on uh, intellectualism is just because we want to encourage us to read, like I said earlier, 
uh, part of um, we having a big category of um, reviewing books on our podcast is just for us to be able to read. Uh, I think that um, there's so much that we could get out of books. And I think that we, we sometimes, being Africans, just uh, rely on uh, people telling us um, what they know, what they read. And we, we will sometimes even quote them verbatim without ha- having to know where the sources are from. So, yeah, we are hoping that we encourage after this um, series of episodes on book reviews to get ourselves to start reading. And if you're reading before, read more. And if you're not, you can start with a small book like this. This book is really small, according to, I mean, that is quite relative. So, well, but it is a small book. It's less than 100 pages, so it's a small book. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, um, should we dive into the first chapter of the book? Or what do we, or maybe the forward? I actually like to read the forward of books. I sometimes find it really, sometimes it just helps for, it gives like a summary of the book. So go ahead. What would you say about the forward of the book as you read? So I basically kind of summarized the forward. Um, there was a forward to the original edition um, and then the one that was done not too long ago in the early 2000s. Um, so one of the things that it tried to focus on is how intellectualism kind of is left out in our Christian walks. Mm. So um, whenever we think of going to church, um, regardless of your denomination, we go through the motions, which isn't good. Um, We might also just decide to do a whole bunch of things, thinking that as a Christian you need to act but not have that understanding of why you're acting like you are, like... um, uh, social causes are a good thing, but having that be the sole basis of your Christian walk mm. and not th- backing it up with theology is something that uh, Stott tried to emphasize. And then the other aspect is just having that uh, spiritual experience, but not also having that backing of theology is one thing that he's also warning us against. So all those aspects are some things that um, the person who wrote the foreword, which is named Mark... Is it Mark Knoll? Mark Knoll. Yeah. um, Tried to uh, elaborate on when he did the foreword for this edition of the book. Um, So um, you you actually highlighted earlier that there's like several... couple of chapters and then we want us to go chapter by chapter and just uh, talk about what really stood out um in the in the uh in the in every chapters and then we can talk about it so yeah go ahead and um, on chapter one what's what really stood out to you as a chapter word or what what would you say chapter one is trying to communicate okay so the heading for chapter one is called mindless christianity And this is in reference to Christianity where you are basically overly enthusiastic about your uh, faith without having any actual knowledge about why you believe what you believe. Mm. So that's already been something that we are experiencing even though this book is from the 1970s. It's something where today even we are just doing and doing and doing without thinking about why we're doing this and in particular to uh, the uh, religious realm not so much the secular realm which he thought basically was trying to kind of say that we are more secular nowadays than Mm. they are uh, leaning toward the religious or the Christian perspective on things. Yeah. I think I really like, um, just like me, just quoting something in the book right now when he said that um, we many have zeal without knowledge, enthusiasm without enlightenment. Now, I think that uh, sometimes it's like, I mean, I, I might be, I, I probably I, I'm also guilty of this. There, there were times in my life that I do things out of the zeal um, of doing it and then if anyone asks me well, why are you doing this it's like I can't even tell you why I'm doing it sometimes it's very it's just 
out of tradition is that because this is our ch church's tradition, this is our church's doctrine. And I can't explain why some of these things, uh, what it means. And I think that uh, over the years, studying had actually helped me to better understand why we do, I mean, I agree of Anglican also, maybe like John Stott. So I agree of Anglican and uh, a lot of church tradition we do are quite biblical, but I, I didn't know why we do it. I didn't, I can't tell anyone why that is biblical in any sense. In fact, if someone had actually uh, really probed what I believe, I probably would have struggled a whole lot because uh, I didn't have a basis for uh, the defense of what I believe. There's no biblical uh, backup for me to explain that. Oh, this is why I believe what I believe. Um, so yeah, I think um, yeah, that's a great point is that it's not just zeal. It's not just having zeal. Um, but also is that is our zeal is is it is it an enlightening zeal is it, is it zeal backed up with knowledge of uh, what we believe and why we believe it so, yeah yeah um, and then further on into the chapter um, he emphasizes that um, sometimes intellectualism is viewed as something that goes against our uh, belief in Christ so basically that if we try to intellectualize it sometimes our pride gets in the way that we're like oh I know how to do this or I know something about the faith which maybe seems condescending to other people mm. um, and so we're when I mean we're I mean like Christians in general might see that intellectualism has no place in the Christian faith. Um, there, mm. like I said in the beginning, there are some things where we just do, so rituals, so that could be like um, certain aspects of Christianity that we do on a regular basis, where we do it without thinking the meaning behind it. Yeah. The symbolic representation of the body of Christ and the blood of um, Christ. Yeah. So we're doing it just because, oh, we, you know, this is something that we do every month in church. So yeah. we're going to have to just eat the bread and drink the juice and leave it at that, where we don't think about what Christ has sacrificed. Um, and that's something that Stott and tried to emphasize that it, we shouldn't just do those practices yeah. without just thinking about them and why we do it and to kind of think critically like do we do this just because this is something that we're taught to or is this something that we're do doing because Christ has told us to do this in the scripture yeah um, to remember what Christ has done for us hmm. I think yeah that, that, that's also a great point is that uh, we I think uh, what's the chapter one about mindless Christianity is is really trying to say is that it it's 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 either there's this extreme of is either is anti intellectualism or we go all the way to just making it and just about our intellect only. So um, it's like I think he's trying to put pull, pull us in the in the middle of having the balance between like Christianity is not just uh, it's not anti intellectual. But also, it is not all about oh, how much do I know. It's like there's, there's, there should be that balance between uh, what we know, and then um, and then the zeal and the emotions. Like, what well, there should be that balance. How does it tie together? We should have that uh, like kind of robust or holistic uh, kind of Christian experience, and not just oh, it's all about feelings. Or no, it's all about head knowledge. So yeah, I think I really like that part too. Go. Okay. So, if we wanted to continue with that, um, whenever I've mentioned in the uh, forward is how we think of activism. So, the activism is not something that we uh, are not supposed to do. It's something we are definitely told to do. Acts, um, faith without works is nothing so we do that tie those two together so the reason why we're doing eating them hungry um, providing shelter for those who don't have it is not just because it's a good thing to do 
it's something that we're instructed to do in the word and it's it's not just something we're just passionate about without thinking why are we passionate about this like is it just because the society tells us this is the right thing to do or is it something that God ordained us to do as um, Christ followers because we should be able to be compassionate to uh, those who are in need um, so on that what you're trying to say is just that we, we should um, uh, there should be our motivations for doing what we do should be out of not just this is cool to do is that it is it, it should be it should be born out of the um, of knowledge of okay this is what we have been commanded to do we have been saved for good works so if we are doing those good works we should not be it should not be mindless good works we are doing good works in response to how God has loved us what has done what he has done for us and then our good works is coming out of that place and I think that um if I get what you're trying to say, I think that what you're trying to say is that we're doing good works, but our good works should be coming out of a place of knowledge, understanding that this is why we do what we do. Um, it's not just an act of just doing charity and just doing whatever we feel like is cool or it's just, yeah, to do. I agree. Um, so the last point he kind of emphasizes is how experience is something that are not told not to do. Um, so something that could be an example of experience is a spiritual experience. So that's not something to take for granted. It's something that we're supposed to kind of in, not just experience something that's spiritual, but like have the understanding that there's a reasoning behind it there's a rationale behind it that god has some kind of ordained purpose for that mm -hmm. experience um it's not something that just comes out of nowhere and we just blindly uh say like oh i have this spiritual experience and i don't know what to do with it but it's it's something that happened to me. So we're doing something a little bit more. Um, that's what Stott was trying to encourage, that we should have not just a spiritual experience, but something that we can kind of d deep dive into it, like why we're why are we experiencing this, um, what God has to say about this situation, um, and if we can find uh, further meaning behind it. Um, I think, like you said, uh, is that, we should be able to create or uh, I mean, we should be able to pick up a cross and really knowing the purpose and uh, we should have zeal. We should not have zeal without knowledge. Is that what you're saying? Mm, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. W do you want to go to chapter two? Just run quickly. Yeah. So chapter two is entitled Why Use Our Minds? So Christians use their should use their minds because their thoughts shape their actions mm. um, one of the things that the book dwells into is these three uh, concepts four actually four concepts that um, all lead to the fact that people should act on what they're thinking on so they so intellectualism is good on its own but it's not an end to them it's not at the end once you um, learn all well you don't learn everything but once you learn something you should be able to do something with that knowledge mm. not just have it sit in your mind and say oh this is great i learned something new but do something with it yeah um, and i think it's 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 kind of i mean saying that it, it sounds like um even the way we it, 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 you're saying that it's possible that for us to just amass knowledge for the sake of it uh, rather than doing something with it because sometimes we in, in our culture we find people amassing wealth for the sake of wealth is that you just keep things for yourself sometimes we look at our closet and then we just have so many clothes there for the sake of having those clothes so is that um so we could actually do that to knowledge too we can actually keep acquiring knowledge for the sake of having the knowledge and do nothing about it is that what you're trying to say that we should do something with our knowledge not just like the way our closet is looking or the way we just, our bank account is looking is that, hey, sometimes it's like we are learning what we are learning 
we are having the privilege of having information or the knowledge we have to be able to do something about it, not just sit on it. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, so as a as it goes further on in the text, uh, we find that there are four aspects. Um, one is creation, so a deep dives into creation. The other is revelation. The other one is redemption. And the last one is judgment. Mm. Um, so with creation, uh, we are shown that Christ uh, or that God um, has created the world and that we should be in awe of it. Mm. Um, and we are humans that are able to rationalize and some things that um, in the world that are creatures, basically, there's a difference between people and creatures. Creatures are not able to intellectualize. They're not able to rationalize as we are. So we're thinking of that in creation. Um, when we are relying on the emotional aspects, we tend to get more instinctual and we tend to vary into the more creature aspects, not the um, rationalized human. So emotions are not bad, but if we just use that as our way to go about the world, uh, it would be a mess, basically. The next part is revelation. So God has revealed himself to humans to show how important the mind is. Um, basically, not just that he per made creation, but also that he has told us that um, how important their mind is. So to say that we acknowledge that God is the creator is good, but if we're not able to process what he has made in nature, then that is not using our God-given mind. Because uh, God uses that understanding of our processes of what nature is to um, reveal himself through it. Uh, the next part is redemption. Mm -hmm. So uh, humans, um, they're being allowed to have renewed minds. So God redeems us by letting Jesus die on the cross for our scenes, sins. So in that sense, um, he was redeemed us. We are sinful, but yet he posed to, chose to have Christ die on the cross for our sins. Um, the last part is judgment, um, where God will judge us based on our knowledge and what we say to his revelation. So we have, um, back in the biblical um, past, Israel did not listen to the word of, of God. It basically was um, something that the people were told to listen to the prophets and when they didn't listen it was something that emphasized how sinful we are um, but we need to come to Christ in humble hearts and be able to understand that um, God wants us to use our minds and not just be uh, controlled by our emotions um, and then also that the role of the Holy Spirit is also emphasized in this chapter um, he wants us to know that, uh, God wants us to know that we can grow in knowledge and that the Holy Spirit will move within you and uh, and kind of inspire you to, to learn more. So that's summary of chapter two, a brief one. Yeah, I think I like um, the, the first part of it that actually he said that we are created to think, we are thinking being. We're also a feeling being. We, we can't say we are not a feeling being, but also I think we are, we, are, we are also a thinking being. I think sometimes we forget that part or we overemphasize the feeling part of us and forget the, the thinking part of us. And I think our faith it shouldn't be without the aspect of our thinking. God has chosen to reveal himself in, the, in words, in the text of the scriptures. And I think that if he, if even though, even, 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 even the unlearned, can still understand that part is that they, even though they might not have the academic um, knowledge or, educa or education like that, but is that it doesn't mean they cannot still understand scripture. So I think that we are we are created to think. 
we are thinking being and I think that um our thinking faculty because that is God actually uses that way also to communicate to us, not just our feelings only. Um so yeah, thank you for that. I think um how about chapter three? We are moving really fast, but yeah. Okay. So chapter three is the meat, as I like to say, of the book. It's called The Mind in the Christian Life. So this is where we go back to the six six aspects of the Christian walk. So um, they are, just to rephrase them, are worship, faith, holiness, guidance, evangelism, and ministry. So we're going to break it up. Um, we're going to talk about worship, faith, and holiness for this session. And then later on, we'll talk about guidance, evangelism, and ministry. Mm -hmm. So with worship, the definition of worship is basically praising God. So there, dis there are different ways in which you praise God. Um, but one thing that is important to know is that a sign of worship during uh, the sign of good worship, I should say, is that we use our minds. So it's not just praising God without thinking about, hey, why are we praising God? Not to be mm. uh, either way. Um, so we praise him for all that he's done for us. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we praise is that uh, he has made us, he has made uh, humans, he has made uh, creatures, nature, all these things that he has gave to us because he promised it to us. Um, and then he has also has created people not just all the same. He's created people with different intellects, um, different walks of life. Uh, those we are called to praise all that is um, created by him. And also to remember that he is an all loving God and and I think I think I think you're right about that. Is that it, just like Ephesians five seventeen says that therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So that how can we know? How can we praise? How can we worship God well? How can we worship Him uh, the way He wants us to worship Him if we don't know what His will is? So I think uh, that kind of really like underscore what you're trying to say about this. That there must be an understanding and even uh, worship. We we need to know why we are doing what we are doing. And I think that how can we know if there's no knowledge part of it, uh, if our mind is not enlightened to know what God really requires of us in worship and all of that. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And then a sign of true worship, not just uh, praising for the praise of it, um, is that we incorporate prayer to it. Mm. Um, so prayer and worship work together in order to engage our mind. So we're using different forms of uh, or aspects of worship in order to make sure that our intellect is being used. Um, I guess we can move on to faith. Uh, this one is something that seems like it's mindless, like we or not mindless, but um, just blind faith. Like we are just believing and not having anything based on that faith. So in that sense, faith and reason t um, are assumed to be complete opposites, which is not the case. Um it is a reasoning trust based on how um, a trustworthy the God is. So there was a, a man that was mentioned in the book called Dr. Lloyd-Jones um, who had emphasized that when we think of natural ph phenomenon, like, for example, um, when we think of birds and their um, ability to go um, where they need to go and migrate during the winter months, um, and then come back there, that's something that maybe we think about as just a natural phenomenon and we don't really analyze it too much. So that's, that's a... Yeah, I think, I think also is that, I think I like how he said that faith is not optimism. It is a reasoning. And I think that, um, we sometimes just um, use faith as um, a way of just, just believe it. 
uh, it's almost like looking to the future and say, yeah, everything is just gonna be fine. And then we we it's almost like we say we 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 almost like we fit it until we make it. No longer like faking it. It's like we just want to um, have a positive view of the future, positive view about life, which is which is great. But it's that we shouldn't replace that with faith. It's not just optimism reasoning. And I think that also is that, um, but rather faith is based on the trustworthiness of God. You were saying that earlier. It's like our faith is, should be based on something. We're not just saying everything will be fine. No, we're going to say everything will be fine because we have a God that says he is on the throne and he wields the power and is sovereign over all. So we're not just basing our faith on whatever. It's not, we're not just, just trying to psych ourselves up with words. It's like our faith, the object of our faith should be God. So the tangibility of our faith is in the person we put it on, not just we just have faith. And I think that's what you're trying to say. And I think um, also is that faith isn't credulity. We're not just just believing for the sake of believing. You just don't question anything. You don't ask any question. There's no basis. Rather, God is not calling us to a life of worship or life of faith without basis it's like he has revealed himself in the scripture yes jesus is, i mean it's an not, not just it's an historical figure that we can go and read about so all that are together is like our faith is not baseless it's not just optimism it's not just oh we just believe because it, uh, yeah we just believe it no it's like there's there's basis for what we believe and we should be able to express that also i agree so we can move on to the last point. The second, the third point is about holiness. Mm. And so for this one, it's one that I struggle to interpret. Um, I know of the holiness of God. That's not any question. Mm. But when we think of how we're supposed to strive to be holy, that's something that I tend to not grasp as quickly as knowing that God is holy. Yeah. Um, so we need to remember that w who we are in Christ, that we are not just um, his creation, but that we are his heir. Yeah, so guys, um, we still have a whole lot more uh, to talk about, but we are trying to keep our podcast really short. So as we promised... Um, next episode we will continue to talk about um your mind matters by john stark thank you guys for listening and then we will see you next time bye